So what happens now? And how do I know when it's just religious superstition? And when it's truly based on scripture? Where does God fit into all of this? Are these days really the end times? When it comes, what's the conclusion? I'm going to pick up on two of the questions that come up. Uh, why doesn't God do it all? And what's the conclusion? But I'll also pick up on that little bit about are we in the end times and, and what that means for us. So let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 um, and I'll start from there. And it's an interesting passage to turn to because this is what it says. 2 Peter 3 verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's an awful lot to get your head around when it's talking about what lies ahead. And I can quite understand why there's a sort of bit of reluctance to ask big questions about what the end times are. One of the things that always strikes me is when you read what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, he actually says, comfort one another with these words. And yet most end time teaching, I think, probably would fit better under the sort of scare each other stiff with these words. <laughs> And I, I think we've come a long, long way from, from what we're meant to be looking at in terms of the end times. This is meant to be positive. You know, one of my big challenges when I was doing a lot of student ministry was that I'd come up against the same philosophical question every time. How does a God of love allow suffering? And you just get that question. And to be honest, there's only one way to answer it, which is to say, it won't be like this forever. It won't be like this forever. There will come a point where there will be no more sorrow. There will be no more sighing. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And everything will reach that level of God's perfection. But there's a price for a new heaven and a new earth. You can only put new people in a new heaven and a new earth. If you put the same old people in the, the new heaven and the new earth, it's going to deteriorate pretty rapidly. So why we are called to preach the gospel now is because we are preparing a new population for a new heaven and a new earth. And that's really important. Also, it's not going to be much of a new heaven and a new earth if we're still having to fight the devil on a daily basis and all of those kind of things. We've still got to contend with the flesh or we've still got to contend with worldliness. Now, the purpose of seeing the ultimate is that we should be looking forward to it. And I've sat through so much end time preaching when I think, oh my goodness, really, have we got to go through all of that like that? And sometimes I think that maybe we won't have to go through it in quite the way that sometimes it's described. But I want to be clear that I do think that there are times of trouble. Uh, but I want to be real about it because, you see, Jesus said, see that you be not troubled. <laughs> You're here of wars and rumours of wars, but the end is not yet. See that you be not troubled. And, and what I do get concerned about is the anxiety build up in the church to the point where instead of there's a crown for those who love is appearing, there's a lot of people who, who don't love is appearing because they're so aware of what the cost of it's going to be. You know, uh, There was a big discussion uh, on the radio not so long ago when people were asking questions about uh, why did the Americans want to do certain things with regard to Israel. And they, they brought in a completely secular person and they said, I don't really understand why they're trying to do all these things for Israel. Is it because they're just trying to rush us all towards Armageddon? And it was a, it was a very interesting perspective from someone outside the system to say, is that what they're trying to do? You know, trying to accelerate everything towards a great cataclysmic conclusion. 
Now, I know that there's a sense in what is trying to be done is to hasten the day. You know, if we do this and if we do that and do the other, then we're going to hasten the day. But really, for me, the main thing that will hasten the day is to preach the gospel and make sure that it's heard in every nation. And I do think we've got a responsibility to the Jewish diaspora and the Jewish nation to preach the gospel again there. That has to be a top priority. And I don't think that there's a sort of um, alternative route into the kingdom of heaven. People come by the cross wherever they come from. But I do think that, you know, what I read in scripture is that there's going to be a great harvest amongst the people that were God's original covenant people. But I'm not sentimental about that. You know, I, 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 I think that there are huge problems and huge issues around these kind of things. But I still believe that our responsibility is to be level-headed and get out there and preach the gospel. And I think that what we need to see is that a large part of spiritual warfare is simply that. It's preaching the gospel. It's preaching the gospel. Now, I actually believe that preaching the gospel makes a difference whether people respond to it or not. Now, that doesn't mean to say that I would preach to an empty room because I believe that you, know, you, you preach to people. But at the same time, I'm aware how the spiritual climate changed in Asia Minor when Paul taught daily in the school of Tyrannus. And, and it wasn't just because of the people who heard it. Somehow, it changed the whole spiritual environment in the area. And I think that's something that we've got to take more seriously. The, the proclamation of the word of God makes a difference, and it's a large part of what spiritual warfare is about. Um, if pastors took that more seriously, I think that would, would make a difference that we need to preach the word in season and out of it and be much more committed to those things. Paul even wrote to Timothy and said, give attention to the public reading of scripture. Yeah. I mean, what, is, what, what does that mean? You know, there are things like this which can make a difference. So I think this is all part of, of spiritual warfare. And also, when I look at how Paul dealt with the situation in Ephesus, seeing I've mentioned it, positioning in Aquila and Priscilla there was, was very significant. They weren't great preachers. As far as I can see, they didn't ever teach in the synagogue, but, and, and Priscilla certainly wouldn't have been allowed to. But the difference they made in terms of, as it were, scouting out the area, knowing what the issues were, walking the streets, praying the area, seeing how much influence Artemis, the goddess Diana, had in the area. And, and when Paul came, there had been groundwork done. And I think Paul knew that. And, and they'd apprentice themselves alongside Paul in Corinth. So there are some of these things that we can do that are really significant and really important. So I think when it comes to hastening the day, I think a lot of that has to do with, with preaching the gospel. The end will not come until everyone's had that opportunity to hear. So we need to get out. I think it's really important to do that. I've got a friend who's really concerned about reaching people in mountainous areas. So he, he spends most of his time trekking mountains and preaching the gospel in places where most people wouldn't go. The number of unreached areas is still significant. There's still a lot to do. There are still people that haven't had the Bible in the language in which they most comfortably read it. And I, I, I think we just need to be, to be more, more careful on some of those things. And I, I'm not just talking about sort of accurate translations into, into different languages. We need to be able to communicate the gospel effectively, even into the language of younger people that don't necessarily read the authorized version of the New King James or anything else. And, you know, I, the only reason I, I stick with the New King James, well, there's two reasons. I mean, I trust it because I think it's based on a, a particularly reliable text. But I also am aware that when I'm preaching overseas, most translations are based on the same text. So, you know, it's easier if I say in this particular verse it says this, and I'm, I'm using a similar original text from the one that they've been translated from into whatever language they are. But I want to be able to communicate effectively. And, and people just don't get it when you're using words that are no longer in date. So communication is really important. And, and, the, and the way in which we serve things up. You know, to be honest, the, the literary level in the countries, even in this country, is not as high as we'd like to think it is. And, and if you've got the idea that most people sit down and read a book that's written in two columns like this and small print, you're, you know, you're, it's not where people are at. 
They, they need something that's more accessible. So we need to be thinking about this. How do we get the gospel? Instead of complaining that people don't listen, let's make sure that they can hear it in a way they understand it. Because nine times the reason ten out people, nine times out of ten people don't listen is they don't get what we're saying. So there's a lot to do, friends. But I think hastening the day by getting the word and, and communicating it effectively and in a way that's culturally relevant is absolutely important. And we need to change. You know, we expect people to come to church in order to hear the word. Well, let's make the church relevant to the people that we want to come. Um, and, and let's do that. I'm not talking about watering church life down so that it doesn't have any distinction between a, a rock concert and a worship session. But um, well, some, some worship sessions would help if they were a bit more like rock concerts, but then there's a different story. But yeah, it's, it, it's, it's getting to the point where we need to be serious. We need to be serious. Just to say, oh, it didn't used to be like this. Well, it is like it. Let's get over it and reach where people are at. You know? Otherwise, we'd just be preaching to their grandparents that are dead instead of preaching to the people that are around and are alive. So I really think taking seriously the hastening the day and, and declaring the word is really important. Now, all these things about the earth being dissolved and everything else, the big thing that's coming across here is we're talking about a new heaven and a new earth. And I still hold out for a new heaven and a new earth, even though a lot of theologians now are talking about a renewed heaven and a renewed earth and suggesting that it won't all be rolled up and transformed quite as radically as we think. But there's something in me that actually believes it's going to have to be pretty radical. And when I look at what we've got in terms of natural disasters and so on, which are all a signal of the fact that this world is not where God intended it to be in the first place, I think it's going to need quite a lot of radical transformation. And I do think that when you read in Revelation, and this is what the end is, that there's going to be a new Jerusalem that comes down into a new heaven and a new earth, then there's a lot that we should be looking forward to. So for me, hastening the day is really important. But I want to say a little bit about staying on track. Oh, and the other thing about hastening the day is let, let's not lose the sense that we want Jesus to come soon. That's not to say that we then sort of neglect the responsibilities of getting out there and preach the gospel, but we do want Jesus to come soon, don't we? You know, in the, in the book of Revelation, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And the church today is praying, oh, hang on in there, we're not ready yet. We need to get ready. We need to be ready. We need to sort things out. It should be a provocation. And he's coming back for a glorious church without spot and without wrinkle. And there's a sense in which we should be making ourselves ready. And it talks about the bride has made herself ready. Well, let's look at some of these things and see what we can do and, and press forward in this. So I, I do believe that we need to be hastening the day. And there are some things that we can do. Now, let's be clear, too, about what that day is going to be. There's a lot that's just mentioned there about heaven and earth melting and all the rest of it. There will be a time of trouble before the end. I think everyone knows that. Whichever version of your pre-millennial, post-millennial, pre-tribulation version you go with, there will be a time of trouble before the end. Um, but, you know, there's something in me that, that is not feeling that I need to rush that or constantly talk about that, or scaremonger around it. I think when it comes, it comes. I'm certainly not going to hoard for it in a tribulation bunker or anything like that. <laughs> but I know that it's going to come, and it's going to be tough. And I think that when that happens, we, we're just grateful. Now, I know some people are believing that we're going to be out of here by then, and, and that's fine if you, if you expect that. I'm, I'm open on these things. I, I try not to be dictatorial. I, I'm with R.T. Kendall, who you know, who used to be at Westminster Chapel. He said to me on one occasion, he said, Hugh, I know I've been right about the end times once in my life. I just wish I knew which time it was. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we all feel like that in some ways.
But there, there has to be a change at some point because the Bible talks about it. And there's so much about the day of the Lord. And the Old Testament predictions about the day of the Lord almost collided the two or elided the two so that you, you, you didn't get a distinction between the first and the second coming. But there has to be a coming to put everything right where things are judged and things are dealt with. And, and we should be believing for that and preparing for that positively and, and knowing that when it comes... And you know, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not one of these people who's trying to hasten that aspect of it. The thing I want to hasten is, is the day when there's a new heaven and a new earth and God's got things as they want to be. And, and that will be the end of the warfare. That's when the devil and his hosts are finally and fully dealt with. And, and that's why God has been so patient. Because he knows that the end will come. You, know, you can put up with an awful lot when you know that there's a, there's a plan that brings everything to a final conclusion. And God's absolutely certain about that. And you've only got to read the last few pages of the Bible. I don't know why some of us are so terrified thinking this is going to happen and that's going to happen. Haven't you read the end? You know? We win. You know? We win. It's, it's not all doom and gloom at the end. It's, it's great. It's glorious. I remember giving a young man a Bible when he was in prison. And uh, I, I, I contacted him afterwards and said, how did you get on with the Bible? What did you read first? He said, I read the last two pages. <laughs> So I said, why did you read the last two pages? He said, look, every book in the prison library has had the last two pages ripped out of it. Because once the first person has found out how the book ends, they don't want anyone else to know. So I thought I ought to read the last two pages first to find out how it ends. And I thought, well, actually, that's not a bad idea, is it? You know, you read those last few pages, you can see that God's got a glorious outcome. And we need to be believing for that, celebrating that preaching the word for that. So what about staying on track, which is something I wanted to talk about? You know, it talks about in the last days, people are going to have itching ears, they're going to go there, they're going to go here and everywhere. And so everyone's looking around for, you see, I can tell that person's got a dodgy doctrine over there, so that definitely means it's the last days. Listen, there's always been dodgy doctrines. And rather than play dodgy doctrine spotting, which is like a Christian sport, Let's play spot the dodgy doctrine. Why don't we actually make sure that we're staying true to the word? That's the most important thing. And it, and it can be quite boring, really, to be sticking to the word in a world when everyone's looking for something new. Now, looking for something new is not new. The Athenians were always looking for something new. And people are just like that today. They've got itching ears. They want something new. So what are we going to give them? Now, the temptation is to try and give them something new. But don't. Don't. You know, what we need to do is to do what El Elijah, Elijah did when that pot had got all sorts of things in it that weren't helpful and everyone's saying there's death in the pot. Stop screaming death in the pot. Just get a handful of flour and put it in the pot. And then it becomes palatable. If we all stopped screaming dodgy doctrine and started preaching some sound stuff, it would change everything very quickly. And you don't have to tell people that they've got dodgy doctrine. I don't think, I don't think the, you know, 2 Kings 4 actually tells me which of those sons of the prophets went out and sliced in the, the wild good. It doesn't say that. Uh, you know what it's like. These days, as soon as someone's got something wrong, it's all across Charisma magazine or this place or somewhere else, and you think, oh, give it a rest, you know. Why don't we concentrate on proclaiming what's right. And then you can remove the poison from any pot, really. So I think that's something we need to be getting on and, and doing and making sure we stay on course ourselves. Now, one thing that will help you stay on course is to realise that spiritual warfare will always have risks. Okay? There's a risk of getting hurt in the battle. But don't let that deter you just make sure that you've got a support group around you. The most vulnerable people in spiritual warfare are the people that think they can do it all on their own. You don't need to do that. In fact, you shouldn't do that. When Jesus sent people out, he sent them out in pairs. 
And if you're going to go, I mean, you know, I was saying earlier that I have this challenge is do I go sometimes as an international speaker or do as I go as a missionary? If I'm going as a missionary, I'll go with someone. If I'm going as an international speaker, you know, they, oh, they spoil you anyway. So, but if you're going to break fresh ground and get into difficult areas, then, then, then be prepared to go with someone. It's just what Jesus did, isn't it, really? He sent them out like that. And, and there is that sense of working in partnership. And the people that are really vulnerable are the ones who think, I'll do it all my way. And we, we need partners. We need people to stand with us. I'm, that's why I'm glad you stand with me in some of the things that I do. It makes a huge amount of difference to know that people are praying. So that is just, to me, something that's really important about staying on track. There's a lot of things that will come along. And to be honest, we get pulled in this direction and that direction. And, and some of the doctrines that come out, they are quite enticing, folks. And they sound like really good. But, you know, to, you get back to the Bible and have another read and have a think about it and think, is that right? Then you don't need to have to, to slam it. You can just bring a gentle correction if need be, which is much more healthy than, than the sort of, you know, shock horror of the way those sons of the prophets were, there's death in the pot, you know, and Elisha just goes, calm down, guys, and just put some flour in, and it's fine. But, you know, we're, we're very good in the Christian world at the moment at kicking pots over. I don't know if you've noticed that, but, you know, don't like this, don't like that, don't agree with the other. Let's get beyond some of that and concentrate on staying on course ourselves and, and have that gracious spirit. Um, you can, you know, you can, you can be gracious. You can, you can walk with people that you don't necessarily agree with all the time, because it's possible to disagree agreeably, isn't it? And these things we can, we can deal with. I know that if we're talking about going out in pairs in a missionary situation, you can't really walk together unless you're agreed. That's obvious. But there are plenty of other situations where you can, you can travel with someone for a season. I've got friends whose lifestyle that most of us wouldn't approve of. But, you know, I'm, I'm prepared to journey with people. You have to accept people where they're at. Not saying, I wish you were someone different from somewhere else. And if you were, I'd befriend you. So there's a lot that we've got to do. And I just want to assure you that there isn't too much worry as you become more mature in Christ about contamination. I know that, you know, bad company corrupts good morals. And some people really worry about, goodness, if I meet with certain people, am I going to be contaminated? the chances are that they'll be contaminated more than you, by you. And that's what we should be really believing for. Um, I do get some surprises. I remember doing a conference with a Nigerian evangelist and, and someone asked a question about, it was at a time when certain Christian people who owned guest houses were not prepared to have gay couples staying in the, in the house. So someone actually asked the question, if you had a guest house, would you allow a gay couple to come and stay? And to my utter, utter shock, he said, yeah, I would. But boy, would I have prayed in that room first. <laughs> and I would have cast out everything. And you know, by the time they walked in, they'd have fallen down on their knees and prayed and repented. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, that's a different mindset. <laughs> but it was just helpful to hear someone that, that, that was realizing that what we carry, if we've got it really in the love of God, doesn't have to be intimidated. The light shines in the darkness. And you know, people, people, you know, some of some people I know, um, they really appreciate my friendship because I don't know how many other friends they've got. And are you going to deprive people of that? You might be the only Christian they know. So why walk away from them? The, there's some great opportunities. Um, there's a lot more we could say about that, but, but you can stay on track. And we do, have, we do have redemptive responsibilities in that we're part of God's plan. We are going to crush Satan under our feet shortly. But we don't have to crush everyone who's been contaminated by Satan in the process. We're meant to be liberating them, just as we were liberated. Come on, some of us have forgotten what we were. Some of us have forgotten what we were. Now, I do know that you, you reckon yourself dead. You know that phase of your life is over. And you're dealing with the flesh in a different way. But come on, guys. You know, some of us do know that we've been washed, we've been sanctified, we've been justified from all sorts of junk. Huh? 
And we don't need it written out large, but I mean, if you were sitting in the church at Corinth and someone said, some of you were this and some of you were that, and some of you were something, you'd be sitting, what am I sitting next to? And then you'd realize they're thinking exactly the same about you. <laughs> but this is the grace of God. And, and we're in a whole different realm. When Jesus said, you know, my kingdom is not of this world or my servants would fight. Yeah, we do fight, but we're not fighting with carnal weapons. We, we need to come on a completely different tack on these things. So my final point when I'm talking about the end is how do you visualise the culmination? I think if I went round and did a little quick survey about end times and asking you what you expected, everyone would be talking about Armageddon, um, you know, Gog, Magog, all of these kind of things. And I wonder why we focus there when the actual end is a new Jerusalem and a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And actually having such a vision of that place that you want everyone to be there. Because people will be changed when they're there. And we're all going to be changed. In the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we'll be changed. And without holiness, no one can see the Lord. So that means that there needs to be a transformation at that level as well in our lives. And so this is the culmination for me. This is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for this thing that has been such an amazing journey in God that right back in the beginning, when God said, let us make man in our image, and having already begun to fulfill that expectation by creating an angelic host, and then you get that rebellion, and then, then you go through the whole of the Old Testament, and God's just teaching object lesson on object lesson, preparing them to understand what warfare is, preparing them to understand what kingship is, preparing them to understand who judges are and what prophets are and what a priest is. And then he sends his son in the fullness of time when all of that has been revealed. Here is my son. And then he goes to the cross in order to reconcile all things so that he can also transform us so that we can be a liberated company that can actually engage in that redemptive responsibility of, of being part of the answer to the problem. Isn't it amazing? You do know that God could have dealt with Satan before we even came on the scene. But you know that he chose not to because he wanted us to be involved in the victory. And think what it's going to be like, friends. You know how they sang when they came through the Red Sea. And the hosts of the enemy had been drowned. They were so, so ecstatic, you know? Miriam with her tambourine and singing and dancing. Do you know when we get in the New Testament, we sing an even better song. We sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. I don't know what the words are going to be. They haven't sent the copy out yet, let alone the music. We just don't know what it's going to be. But it will be a song of victory. It'll be greater, it'll be greater, greater, greater by far than anything like coming out of Egypt and crossing the Red Sea. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? You see, the, the Victorians, they had this understanding of death as crossing Jordan into the Promised Land. That's how they saw it. And, and in a sense, we should have that anticipation when it comes to looking at what it's going to be like at the culmination of all things. It's going to be such a deliverance. It's going to be so incredible. You know, what's it going to be like to have a new body? I don't know. It's better than having this one healed, actually. And, I, and I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly worried about what strange powers it possesses. I know there was an American general who wanted to test things out by walking into a wall to see if he could walk through it one day because he was anticipating his new body. I don't know how much he bruised his existing one, but I'm not interested in that. that that's not what interests me. I, I want to be in that place where I can worship God without distraction. That's what I want, and that's what I think we're heading for. And I hope that you want that. I really do. I know that we seem to have moved into a very materialistic understanding of heaven these days. I go to conferences where people will tell me they've, they've ordered gold taps for their mansion and all the rest of it, and I think, you just have to wait and see what you get, you know? But, but I'm not interested in that, you know? 
If, if, there's, if there's a worship service in the center of the New Jerusalem and we're gathered to worship the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit with the angelic host, I'm not going to be taking a bath in my mansion turning on my golden taps. <laughs> that would be just so pointless, wouldn't it, really? I want to be where he is. And, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm happy to be a doorkeeper in the house of God, but there's so many people who want to be doorkeepers, I think it's going to be a bit crowded by the door. I'm hoping that we can get a bit closer to the throne. Have you got that kind of expectation? Because you need that. Because this is what makes the fight worthwhile. We will win. And I, I want to see so many, 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 many people who at the moment we consider to be enemies of the cross, actually become people that are fit for that kingdom. That's what I want. That's so much more important. I wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know, some of us bring that down and think principalities and powers also apply to earthly powers, and maybe they do. But I also believe with all of my heart that that's not where the fight is. In the end, we do need to see a victory that's won that really brings the honour and glory to Jesus and ushers in a new heaven and new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And do you want that? I want that. But I also want to do everything I can possible to make sure that that new Jerusalem is populated. I want some surprises there. I really do. I didn't know that you'd come to believe Jesus on your deathbed. You know, I had no idea that in the end you were going to say yes to someone you'd resisted all your life. I had no idea that leading that alternative lifestyle that was so alternative that it was even alternative to every other alternative, <laughs> that in the end you were going to say, but you know, more than that, I want Jesus. I didn't know you were going to say that. But I'm expecting them for some surprises. And I'm praying for some surprises too. That's part of my spiritual warfare, actually. I want to snatch as many people out of the enemy's grip as I possibly can. <laughs> I really do. And so many people haven't even got a clue they're in the enemy's grip. Do you enjoy being a believer? Yeah. So why not see a few more people become believers so that they can enjoy it? Let's pray. Father... Help us to see the culmination of things in a way that speaks hope into our hearts and drives us forward to see your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, we ask for that and pray that from this day forward, our spiritual warfare might yield results for the kingdom and that you'll keep us strong and keep us brave and keep us people that really make a difference and actually are transformed in the process too because we want that and we need that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.